right, so picking up from where we left off yesterday, here's a quick refresher of the first part of cell respiration. So we start with glucose, which is a six carbon molecule. And in the cytoplasm, our first step happens, which is glycolysis. Glycolysis is actually a multi-step process that requires several enzymes. But ultimately, all glycolysis really does is it takes our six carbon glucose and it splits it into two three carbon molecules called pyruvate. And technically, uh, a hydrogen or two hydrogens from glucose are also uh, transferred over to a coenzyme called NAD plus, and it becomes NADH. So it goes from a, its oxidized form to its reduced form. Now, it makes also four ATP, but it costs two ATP to get it started. So your net gain at the end, you've really only gained two ATP. We also talked yesterday about what happens after glycolysis if no oxygen is present. Because if oxygen is present, which is where we're going to pick up today, everything's going to move to the mitochondria. The NADH are going to pass their hydrogens over to the mitochondria, um, and we're going to continue. But if there's no oxygen available, your cells don't give up. They basically, what they need to do, and this is the important part, why does fermentation happen? The purpose of fermentation is to recycle NADH back to NAD+, because if you run out of NAD+, you can't run glycolysis anymore. And I gave the analogy in class that if you came home and you had a whole bunch of groceries in your car and you could only carry, let's say, two bags at a time, you grab two bags, you're like NAD, and the bags are like the hydrogen. You carry those into your house. Until you can put those down somewhere, you can't go back to your car to get more bags. And the same is true here. So fermentation is a way of NADH getting rid of that hydrogen so it can go back to being NAD plus again, which is necessary for glycolysis because it picks up hydrogens and then glycolysis can keep going, which means you could keep making a little bit of ATP because you could keep making for every glucose two ATP. So fermentation in bacteria makes ethanol and carbon dioxide gas, which um, that's the products. It recycles the NAD. The uh, pyruvate gets turned into ethanol, and carbon dioxide is released. In us, we make lactic acid. So it still takes the pyruvate, turns it into lactic acid, recycles the NADH back to NAD+. Your muscles may burn a little bit, but it gives your cells a few more minutes worth of ATP before they would run out completely. All right, so we're going to pick up now with what happens if oxygen is present. So we're going to go back to our... PowerPoint, whoops, um, here we go. So um, if oxygen is present, the oxygen is actually what's gonna end up picking up those hydrogens from NADH. So either way, NADH has to get rid of the hydrogens. Uh, but if oxygen is present, that's gonna happen later on in the cell respiration process. And in the best case scenario, about 40% of the energy from glucose is harvested, meaning captured in ATP. That's what we mean by harvested. That the energy from the glucose is captured by ATP. The rest of it is actually lost as heat. So I gave the analogy in class of glucose being sort of like a $10 bill and you're breaking it into ones to run like a bunch of reactions in your cell that require singles. Technically, you're taking your $10 bill, but you're only getting about $4 out of it and the rest of it is lost as heat. The other six bucks is sort of goes down the drain. All right. The next step in cell respiration is called oxidation of pyruvate because pyruvate is going to become oxidized, which we really haven't talked about. But bottom line is um, that pyruvate was a three carbon molecule. And as it enters the mitochondria, it actually forms a different molecule, which happens to be a two carbon molecule called acetyl coenzyme A. And in this step, we actually lose carbon dioxide, uh, and it also makes, I believe, some more NADH. You don't have to memorize any of that. It's just a little mini step that needs to happen as the pyruvate crosses into the mitochondria. And so I mention it because you may see acetyl-CoA or acetyl coenzyme A somewhere, and, um, and hopefully then it sounds kind of familiar to you. So citric acid cycle is our next major step, and this is going to occur in the matrix of the mitochondria. So a reminder, the matrix of the mitochondria is this middle part. If you think of the mitochondria as a double membrane, like a balloon blown up inside another balloon, the middle of that second balloon, that would be the matrix. And so this is a series of steps. It starts with acetyl coenzyme A, which came from uh, the pyruvate. 
And it basically breaks all that into CO2. So by the end of the Krebs cycle, and this is sort of important, all the oxygen and all the carbon from glucose have become CO2. And that's going to get released as a waste product. The only thing that's left, and this is really significant, are the hydrogens. That's what's going to go to our last step. So you see the hydrogens here and here. So NAD+, plus, so more of this coenzyme NAD, becomes NADH, and FAD becomes FADH2. This is a different coenzyme. And these, these, these uh, coenzymes with the hydrogens on them are going to carry energy to our third and final step. Uh, so this is really, really significant because um, if you were asked, you know, what part of glucose really has the most potential energy, it's the hydrogens. The hydrogens are going to go to the electron transport chain. And as a matter of fact, it doesn't say it here, um, but at this point, and you'll see it in a second, by the end of um, the Krebs cycle, so our glucose became pyruvate, pyruvate crossed over, it made some more NAD, and uh, this became what's called acetyl coenzyme A. This goes into the Krebs cycle, which turns two times, because there's actually two of these acetyl coase, because remember you had two pyruvates. Um, anyway, the citric acid cycle, notice here, it actually makes two ATP. So at this point, um, you started with glucose. By the end of the Krebs cycle, we had glycolysis in the Krebs cycle. We have made a total of net of four ATP. Two here in the citric acid cycle and uh, two net in glycolysis. We've also made all of our carbon dioxide, all the CO2 from glucose is gone. And then all the hydrogens from glucose are on these coenzymes. Now we're going to make a total of about 36 ATP. My point is, if we've only made four so far, this last step must be huge because this is where all the ATP are going to be made. And that is the case. So this is a picture of what the Krebs cycle really looks like. It's uh, The reason it's sometimes called the citric acid cycle is because this very first thing that's made is citrate or citric acid. And so that's where the name comes from. You don't have to memorize all these steps and all these enzymes. You could be given a picture of this and ask questions about what's happening, you know, as far as how many NADHs are being made or, or things like that. But you should be able to figure all of that out really from the picture without any background information. All right, so our last final step is the electron transport chain. So what the electron transport chain really is, is a collection of proteins in the inner membrane. That's the cristae. So again, if we redraw our mitochondria, a balloon inside of another balloon, the cristae, is, it's this inner membrane. Um, and that's where these proteins are located. And what's going to happen is NAD and FAD are going to give away their electrons. Technically, their electrons and their hydrogens. The electrons are going to get passed down the electron transport chain. Protein to protein, very much like what happened in the light reactions of photosynthesis. Um, and I do have an animation of this uh, in the playlist that you should be able to see. Um, and at the same time, the next slide is going to explain that hydrogens are going to get pumped. This is going to power pumps that pump the hydrogen ions across the membrane into the intermembrane space. So, and uh, I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Oxygen is really important here. So this whole process, we said oxygen is necessary, oxygen is necessary. I've never said what it actually does. This is what it actually does. So it is waiting here at the end of the electron transport chain, sort of sucking the electrons and the hydrogens towards it to make water. If there's no oxygen, none of this is going to happen because there's no attraction. It's sort of like if you were trying to get a strange animal to come to you, you might hold out a treat, you know, some food. And food might be the lure that then the animal comes to you. That's what's happening here. Oxygen is sort of like the treat. And, uh, and hydrogen and, and the electrons are really attracted to it. So as long as there's oxygen, it's going to pull everything along this electron transport chain. No oxygen, nothing's going to happen. Notice, I haven't mentioned ATP being made yet. We're going to make a bunch of ATP, but the electron transport chain itself does not make the ATP. The ATP are going to be made in the next step. So the electrons go to, down the electron transport chain, and this powers hydrogen pumps. Again, we just talked about photosynthesis having these same hydrogen pumps, and they pump all the hydrogens into the intermembrane space. So again our little mitochondria, and all the hydrogens are getting pumped here into this space between the outer membrane and the inner membrane by these proteins that are located in the membrane. So the electrons are going down an electron transport chain, electrons, 
and the hydrogens are getting pumped into this intermembrane space. And then what's going to happen is they build up and they flow back in high concentration to low concentration through that same enzyme from the light reactions, ATP synthase. And this is going to generate all those ATP. As a matter of fact, uh, for every NADH, we're going to generate 3 ATP. And for every FADH2, it's going to generate 2 ATP. You do not have to memorize those numbers. Uh, it's not important to memorize the numbers, but you do need to understand that that's where all of our ATP really come from. Hardly any of them are made in glycolysis in the Krebs cycle by substrate level phosphorylation. Almost all of them are made in this step, which is chemiosmotic phosphorylation, because you have a difference, an electrochemical gradient, a difference in hydrogen ions. Sometimes it's called a proton gradient because a hydrogen ion is a proton, because hydrogen is number one on the periodic table, so it's just one proton and one electron. So without its electron, it's a proton. So sometimes this is called a proton gradient. So here's what it looks like. I've shown you this before. Hydrogens come off of NADH. The electrons go down an electron transport chain, and the hydrogens get pumped into the intermembrane space. And this buildup, they now are, are going to go from higher to lower concentrations through ATP synthase, and this is going to make all the ATP. Here's a little summary. So glycolysis was in the cytoplasm. It made two net ATP, makes four, but because it costs two, our net gain is only two. It also made some NADH. The NADH, assuming oxygen's present, are going to go to the mitochondria. They're going to pass off their hydrogens to the mitochondria, and the NAD plus is going to actually get recycled. Um, oxidation of pyruvate. So uh, the three carbon pyruvates, there's two of them, they're actually going to turn into a two carbon molecule called acetyl coenzyme A, uh, and we're going to make some carbon dioxide. The citric acid cycle is going to finish making some more carbon dioxide. So all of our glucose becomes carbon dioxide. And the citric acid cycle is going to make some more of these coenzymes, NAD and FAD. And these are all going to go to the electron transport chain where you're going to make about 32 more ATP, so most of your ATP. Uh, so here's a summary. Glycolysis made a net of two. Citric acid cycle made a net of two. Actually, a total of two. And the electron transport chain is going to make 32, about 32 more using the chemical gradient, the electrochemical gradient created by the hydrogens being pumped across the membrane and the electron transport chain. Reminder that the ATP made in glycolysis and the Krebs cycle are made by substrate level phosphorylation. If you recall, that is where ATP is made by literally hooking up with an enzyme that transfers a phosphate over to ADP. And the ATP that are made in the electron transport chain are made by chemiosmotic or oxidative phosphorylation, which is the way of making it using an electrochemical gradient. In this case, a proton gradient because of your hydrogen concentrations. Um, and finally, last slide, just a reminder that you don't have to use glucose. Glucose is usually what we use, but fatty acids, fats, can be broken into glycerol. Glycerol feeds right into the um, glycolysis, and the fatty acids will feed, will become acetyl-CoA. There's a beta oxidation is the name of a process by which you can convert fat into products that can be used by the mitochondria. This actually makes even more ATP. Because fatty acids, if you recall, are long chains of just carbon and hydrogen. The more hydrogens you have, the more NADH and FADH2 you can make, which means the more ATP can be made. And then you can also use proteins. So if you're on like keto diet or South Beach diet, Atkins diet, these high protein diets, um, you'll use protein to make some of your ATP. Proteins get broken into amino acids. They have to go through something called deamination, where the ammonia group or the amino group is removed which is why you need to drink lots of water if you're on a high-protein diet because your kidneys have to process that ammonia, turn it into urea so you can urinate it out of your body. So high-protein diets, you're making a, a product that you need a lot of water or you may damage your kidneys. But bottom line, um, then the amino acids can get fed directly into the Krebs cycle or uh, turned into acetyl coenzyme A and, again, can be used to generate energy. So that is a summary of cell respiration.